You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Welcome to episode 169 of the Life in Ruins podcast. I'm your host, David Ian Howe. Carlton is somewhere in the Western Hemisphere, probably in the West Indies. And uh, Connor is at a party, and I am here. I have no idea what I'm supposed to talk about today. They said, just talk about dogs and please don't cancel us. I'm going to try my fucking best. Okay, <laughs> here we go. So, <laughs> starting off good. I recently posted a lecture, uh, or not recently, this was January, on YouTube of me giving a lecture on just like the history of dogs. If you go to YouTube, you type in history of dogs, and it's history of dogs, colon, archaeology, evolution, mythology, I think. And it took off. Uh, that was pretty wild to me. And I gave that talk in November at the University of Wyoming. And here's the thing about media, guys, like make all of your presentations. Like if, if you're in academia, if you're in CRM too, or just any business, or just you're, you're just interested in archaeology, take a public speaking course. And also learn to record, learn like AV equipment and learn to edit just basic stuff. And it's kind of amazing now that on TikTok and Instagram, there's like full on editing programs and software that's already on the app. You don't have to use like Adobe or DaVinci Resolve anymore. I'm getting too technical, but my point being, I had a camera pointed at me and it was makeshift. I had no idea like what angle to do it at. And I was trying to film it like a TED talk. I didn't have a second camera to look at the audience, nor did I have their permission to record them. She should probably always get that consent is key. And then, yeah, it just kind of was a weird angle at the podium. Uh, and you couldn't see the slot, like the screen above me. It's just me at the podium and a giant blackboard. And I found out when I was editing, like, oh, shit, I can put words. <laughs> I can like write on that chalkboard with what I'm talking about. And then instead of having the PowerPoint on top, just like a boring ass slide, which a lot of YouTube lectures are i put b-roll which is b-roll is the secondary stuff that you know goes over top of people talking so like if you're talking about bison you'll see like bison eating grass or in like a murder mystery it's like you know someone's hands with blood on them like b-roll but yeah so like a wolves bison archaeology stuff in this one yeah so a lot of things in the lecture on the fly I misspoke or just misquoted, and I also notice I have so many ticks, or I say <clears throat> like every time, or like yeah, yeah, and it like you get to edit that stuff out, and anything you don't like or how you sound, you can edit out. And there are parts where I said like Quetzalcoatl and Sholot go down there and they get the bones, but I, I I meant to say that I meant like into the underworld they're supposed to go get the bones. In the lecture, I said they go down there and they get the dogs, which makes no sense based on what I was saying. Shalot and Quetzalcoatl go down into the underworld to get all the previous versions of humans that the gods tried to make that failed, and they get the bones and the dog sniffs them out, and they take those bones back to Earth and make the fourth iteration, I think fifth iteration in Aztec mythology or Mexican mythology to make humans. Uh, and then the god smashes... Miklantequitli is the god of death there, and he smashed the bones up out of like spite, and that's why people are all different sizes. But anyway, I, I misspoke. So I took, clearly I said dogs a lot in the lecture. I took, or I'm sorry, I said bones at some point in the lecture, and I took that clip and put it over where I said dogs, and this is getting really technical, but that's the beauty of being able to edit your own stuff. And on that whiteboard, or the blackboard, all the corrections that I had like things that I misspoke on the fly because I usually walk away from the podium and I've rehearsed this lecture a million times. I didn't quite refer to it correctly or state a fact right. So on that whiteboard, I could add text, which then I could animate with the basic like dissolve or like disappear animation, or I can like add a cool graphic where it like buzzes like it's electric. And the constant B roll on top of the thing, my therapist actually recently, I got a new one in the last three months, two months. She like, I sent her a lecture the first, like after my first session. And I was like, this is what I do for like a living. If that helps you like understand my 
many issues. <laughs> and the one thing she pointed out, like firstly, was that I have ADHD. Clearly, it's why I have the therapist. But she said, I'm using that ADHD in the way my mind works to keep people's attention. And obviously, my lectures are a little more entertaining than other boring ass YouTube lectures on YouTube uh, and a lot of lectures I've seen in person by professors. Not to gloat, I'm just saying, like, the way I edit and the way I speak is engaging because I keep talking. And maybe I've lost you in this podcast because I say um and but or whatever too much. But the way I speak, I kind of say it as in, like, I speak in verbal parentheses, like, I'll. I'm speaking and then like I'll add another thought in the middle of that sentence into parentheses if you saw it written and then after the parentheses finish the thought. I don't know if that makes sense to you in the slightest, but that's how I speak. And she pointed out that that keeps people constantly on edge. There's no point in the lecture where I kind of just stop or at least I edited it that way too, where I kind of just stop talking except at points where I needed like, you know, a pregnant pause. And that apparently keeps people engaged because they don't have time to stop and think. And when you have time to stop and think, that's when you get distracted. So I just keep adding information and adding information on top. And that kind of like, it'll eventually click with everything I'm saying. It makes sense at the end and you have to make it go full circle. So each slide, I kind of do that or I'll bring like a section of the PowerPoint back. This is all probably meaning nothing to you and nothing about archaeology, but it's just archaeologists are really shitty at talking and that's why i started doing this and connor and carlton and i started the podcast i i can't explain it it's just like not to say it's like stand-up comedy but i guess it is i said that last episode i was on like the audience is your barometer for how you're doing when i was in class as an undergrad i would sit there and just zone the fuck out when they were talking about pythagorean theorems and i was like i mean yeah it's interesting hypotenuse is it's a cool word actually that's the one thing i took from you know math class the geometry the geometry I excelled at everything else was just dog shit had to take remedial classes over the summer and see these these are the segues that I go on anyway archaeologists <laughs> are bad at speaking and I think it's important that everybody I had to take a public speaking class in college and I was very very anxious like around my friends I could speak just fine and I was myself but around new people and especially around women, I was like the classic kid who just froze and was like, uh, and then just ran away. And it was like crippling. And I found out later I had, you know, anxiety and issues. And then I, I worked on that in therapy. Also, a lot of that is getting older. I, I can't really tell which is which, but both have helped the anxiety. And I took a public speaking class and it was rough. Like I, the structure of it and how you're supposed to talk and stand and whatnot. That was difficult for me, but I learned a lot. And I even messaged that professor. I found her on Facebook a couple of years ago and was like, Hey, I really appreciate you doing a public speaking class or whatever. And she was like stoked and saw my YouTube and stuff. But yeah, it really, it just helped me get out of my comfort zone. And if you're an undergrad and you're going into grad school for this stuff, you're going to have to learn how to present because you got to present every paper you write and then your thesis or your dissertation later on. And maybe if you're working in CRM or you just work in an office crunching numbers, you're probably going to have to present at some point. So keep that in mind. The, the point is, I mean, the point of public speaking is to get the point across, but I like to give things, Dave Chappelle does this well, where he makes it come full circle. So he'll talk about a topic in the beginning and then at the end of the entire show, he'll bring it back. Or just sometimes in the segments he does, he'll bring it back. So always have a point that circles back to what you're saying. And that keeps people, if they zone out, they click back in, I think, when the, you bring that in. And that's why Dave Chappelle is wildly successful at stand-up comedy. Actually, I would consider him currently the best in Louis C.K. I mean, barring all their the shit, I don't care. But anyway... <sighs> public speaking and the the lecture did well and i think i was going on a rant about my therapist like adding the pictures and stuff on top and the animations and like i even have all the art that that artist draws for us it, it was used to be the podcast logo and i had him sketch out like various scenes with dogs in them and prehistoric scenes just so i can 
literally paint the picture for people in the audience of what I'm talking about so I can put them into the setting. If I'm just talking about lithics or dog bones and there's just words on the slide and maybe a clip art of a dog, who's going to fucking care? So I add that artwork because it just puts people in the, in the mindset and his style is so unique and like kind of graphic novel -y that it really pulls you into a story. And I got a lot of comments about that. And I was like, yeah, Tori Moss is fucking gifted. So adding that, and then sometimes I'll take little clip I'll, in Photoshop, which is also learn how to do. I can cut out pieces of those art. So like a person that's in it or an elephant or a bison and use that and other things. And then I can animate that bison to walk across the screen. And just to make it kind of not goofy, but just to keep people's attention. And it also is just the way I explain things and how I, I don't see things in my head. I just like feel them or think them, I should say. So like editing videos to me is like a, it's like a canvas and it's like it, videos are like not to say it's an art form. I mean, it is an art form. It's why it's like, I guess BAFTA is a thing, but <laughs> the Oscars, but yeah, it, it helps me organize my thoughts and gets my, gets my thoughts across much like Van Gogh would paint or Shakira would sing and Shakira. And I, I mentioned Photoshop and Adobe Premiere and DaVinci Resolve. Those all sound intimidating. And I'm going to tell you one thing. I learned Photoshop and everybody should learn how to Photoshop, especially these days. If you need to get not back at somebody, but like you need to edit something or maybe you missed a date on uh, something and you just Photoshop the date. Uh, I didn't mean to do that. I just, well, in that case I did. I really shouldn't go into the legalities of what I did with that one, but other things too, where I like, you know, had to edit a, yeah, like edit the green screen out of the photo. Like I'm in right now, I'm sitting by the green screen, which you can do in Photoshop and then Premiere and video. But what I wanted to get at is I learned Photoshop in college by making memes because that's when like actual memes were a thing before videos were, where you had the the meme on like the text on top and the thing on the bottom and like it was a cat or is the girl with the the house burning in the background or the overly attached girlfriend or what was the other one bad luck brian all those things i learned how to do that because in photoshop then i was like hey what font is those memes made in and I looked it up and it's called impact bold and then i went to that and then i was like okay that doesn't look right it needs a border around the text also because if it's just a white text on a background there's no border to just dis distinguish it from the flatness of the color on it. This will make sense in a second. And then there, I, I would go just Google it. Like, how do I do that? And then you right click on it and then you go to, you know, pro or not properties. There's a, can't directly explain the blending options. You click on the layer and go to blending options and it will say like stroke or glow. And then the stroke is the, the outline of those words. And from there I was like, okay, I can make memes. And then you learn to export it and so forth from there and then one time i was like hey how do i edit this giant zit out of my face clearly there's a lot of videos on that on youtube so i'd look that up and google it i know what what i'm getting at here is it's absolutely easy and i there's skillshare and there's youtube tutorials and there's all these things that are just so intimidating and when i wanted to do all this i sat down listening or with skillshare and paid for it and i was like all right episode one and they were like welcome to adobe premiere press file and I, it was just numbing for me and trying to animate I, just, I couldn't do it but when i lecture and if you guys are going to make a video or you're going to give a presentation or use photoshop or premiere or whatever you'll come across something where you're like how do i convey that and i wanted to make the in this video make the clovis people the person and the dog come from beringia to or from Asia across Beringia into the Americas. So to do that, I would look it up and like I knew how to do it at this point, but this is just an example. There's things called keyframes where you like the piece, like the, it's how you animate. There's a timeline and you put little dots on this timeline of where that photo should be in space. And then you can move it around from there and you can adjust it to the time. That's animation, like moving an arm back and forth of like a, a little character. That's all it is. It's a keyframe there to keyframe back, like one, two, three. And then add that times 400,000 million, you get a Pixar movie. Now, I, that's, I, I used to be pissed about how much those people made. I'm like, damn, like, why is like movie people make so much money? That's a lot of work. 
like is a lot of work and they outsource it to teams and stuff. But I started this off by talking about dogs and lectures. The only reason you don't know how to edit or you don't know how to take photos or make video or whatever is because one, you haven't started. And then two, you haven't needed to yet. And when you need to, like when I needed to make a meme in class when I was bored in undergrad, I learned Photoshop. And then from there, I learned the tools. And then Premiere, I start, and I was like, how do I edit a video? And Premiere is like what Netflix shows use. I know Black Mirror, I like even they show it in there. They use um, Adobe Premiere to make movies. So you can make, you know, Avatar with Adobe Premiere. I'm sure they use other things. And you can also make a shitty little animation of a dog walking across Beringia. And all that is is Googling answers and questions. Public speaking is it's what you make it. And I obviously try to make mine funny, which makes it engaging. And then I do the full circle thing and I keep people in like a loop so they can, you know, come back in. That's the full circle thing, I guess. But I'm running out of time here on this segment. I'll take this into the next segment and start off with that thought. Welcome back to episode 169 of a Life in Runes podcast. It's just me, David, and you listening, unless it's a few people and you're screening dirt somewhere in a, the desert or in the middle of the woods full of poison ivy. I ended the last one talking about the full circle shit, but I want to continue with like the editing and stuff like that. I know if you've tuned out, Ironically, because I'm talking about how I communicate, that's fine. And if you're still engaged, literally anything you're doing, like if you're in CRM, if you're, like I said, crunching numbers, there's something you're going to need to learn. And like whether that's Excel or Microsoft Access or I mean Google Docs or something like that, there's always a way to make that more efficient and to Google how to do it. And like, I think a lot of people get bogged down with doing tutorials and like, how do I start this? Or you know, like I was saying with the, the animating, but really it's just, you're, an, you're asking questions. Like, how do I make this thing happen? How do I make this fade to black? Okay. I want to add fire on top of the video. So I have to find a video of fire but then one that has a green screen too, where you can take out the, it's called key, color key. And you essentially, that's what a green screen is. You tell the computer this pixel, like that exact color, and you can add a little range to it, take that out. And that's how like Marvel movies are made and like how Iron Man's flying. It's just like the, the computer, that's what's such a solid green and like vibrant color is so that it can easily be distinct or you can easily differentiate it from the subject and the um you know the background and all of that then requires lighting and that's all stuff i had to learn too but green screen like that that's a major thing especially with what i do and like how the hell do you do that and i just googled it and it's apparently really easy and from there i would say the number one thing if you're gonna I'm going back into to media now. If you're going to make videos or want to, I mean, if you just want to succeed in whatever business you're in, I think everything's going to be needing video at some point or it will help you stand out. So I'm just going to talk about my expertise on this. I wouldn't say expertise, just experience. So I wanted to, let's say, for example, let's go with the flame thing. I found a flame, like a there's stock footage websites like Storyblocks. You've probably heard of that as a sponsor on some videos. And it's a website you can type in cows or you can type in like weaving or I can type in Native American or I can type in birds and it will show you specific stuff or like mushrooms and or ocean or ships. And you can so pick from different things, different options, download that and add it onto your video. And then I think it's like 350 bucks a year. Not my favorite price, but... It works. So in that flame, like I downloaded a video of like sparks, it's animated, but there's a background that's a green screen to it. So maybe it was actually sparks and there's a green screen behind it. I don't know. I tell the computer, pull out that green color and Adobe, you just go, you add the effect, go to the effect panels, put it on there. It, it's just like Excel when you want to insert a table. It's that easy. Like you just click a button, Google it. Okay. Figure it out. Now I have flames. 
But then you also need to add sound and sound is something that is really important. Honestly, if your video is shitty, but your sound is good, that's great. And if you're like, your lighting is also really important too, but that adds to a shitty video. But sound is of like the utmost importance. Cause that's like what, like put it this way, when you watch like a murder mystery doc, sometimes you'll hear like the v recording of somebody like on a tape. And then there's just like an animation of like a wavelength and like a picture of John Wayne Gacy or something like that. You don't need video. Like that, it helps watch, but the sound is what matters. That's the content. But in this case, like I wanted to immerse somebody into the video, like of the caveman skits that I do. And so I had those sparks fly up and I had them over top of the video. It goes like, whoosh, and I had to look up K whooshing sound or like, whoosh, like I couldn't, it's hard to describe onomatopoeia in letters, but. Then I have something called Epidemic Sound, which is also, it's a stock sound website and you can look up stop music or stock sound effects. And yeah, so I looked up like, I forget what I found, but you can pick through a bunch of stuff and then you add that underneath the video of the flames. And by underneath, I mean Photoshop, if you're familiar with it and PowerPoint too, you have the text layer and then you add graphics on top. Everything's layered and that's how everything media wise works. I mean, editing audio is a little different, but detracting from the, the flame example. So I keyed out the color of the flame, right? The green screen. So now there's just sparks over top of my video. And then on top of the video sound that I had, I add this, like the whoosh sound. So that way, or, oh, it's was like torch. That's what it was. I typed in torch sound. And it's like, whew. so not only does that visualize, okay, like fire cave and like the cave background is what is on the background when I'm in the video the whoosh sound like adds to it and sound. I don't think you realize how much it, it immerses you into stuff. If you sit and listen, think about this planet earth. When you watch those, there's no sound that is all added later. There's no way with how far they are from those ants or how far they are from a polar bear. They're not going to get it's like feet, like crunching on the ice. That's all added later with stock sounds, but I'm sure with the BBC or whoever makes planet earth, I think, I think it's BBC they probably have very professional people who go out after that polar bear has moved and like make that same sound in that area or in a studio somewhere. But the reason planet earth is so immersive is the video and like the drone footage is amazing, but it's the sound that immerses you and you don't think about it. And every video, like movie you watch, the sound is of the utmost importance. Like it, I can't even describe it. Like we just saw Oppenheimer and of course, like the visual of a nuclear bomb exploding, how do you do that without a nuclear bomb? Christopher Nolan had to, I believe he used fire and ping pong balls and then added a bunch of lights and colors to it and put it in like a, I forget how he did, but he like essentially with like smoke or steam or something. I don't know how he did it. It was all practical effects. That was his, his setup. So you don't think about that stuff when you're watching and how do you replicate the sound of a nuclear bomb? And especially in the, in the movie, if you haven't seen it, obviously they make a nuclear bomb. It's the point of it. It blows up and then there's the, the, I guess it's the Doppler effect or just the speed of sound is different than the speed of light. The bomb blows up and for about 30 seconds to a minute, I think in the video or the movie, you don't hear the sound of the bomb or none of the, like the shockwave of it hits. So there's so much tension in the movie and when it explodes, Oppenheimer's like, <sighs> when he's watching it and that's all you feel because in that moment or here, sorry, Oppenheimer is like, Literally, I am become death, destroyer of worlds. Like, he's like, what have I done? Like, holy shit, this thing works and it's going to destroy everybody. And the point, kind of like Jurassic Park, you didn't stop to think if you should, but you st like only wanted to know if you could. And I'm, I'm getting away from the sound thing, but th this will make sense. Maybe a full circle. I don't know. The, the, you're feeling with him in that sound when he's breathing, like the anxiety and the oh my God. And it's silent, right? And you're like with him and my heart was pounding because you knew this was coming. And then they add, this is interesting, they add the actual clip of Robert Oppenheimer saying, I am become death, destroyer of worlds from the Bhagavad Gita. It's the Hindu Bible script thing. The dude spoke and could read Sanskrit. It's pretty crazy. I'm getting away from the sound. You're, you're sitting there in the silence with him and like, with all the people watching the bomb test and Josh Peck hits the button to detonate it, you're seeing the bomb explode with him. 
right? And the bomb back there, it's like a crazy, like bright light, and you're Christopher Nolan just killed it in this movie. But the sound wave, then after Oppenheimer and you are sitting there in the silence of there's like the and like the bomb hits you in the theater. And in the theater, Christopher Nolan's whole goal was that like the whole theater would rumble when it hits you because you're literally being hit by the shockwave of the bomb with the characters of the movie. So it it immerses you. And I don't think you realize how much sound matters. And like when Chris and Rachel edit our podcasts, like you got to put a lot of care into it. So this, you would think like, it's just a track of me talking, but they also have to add, like cut out ums, cut out stuff that is irrelevant. Usually when I say something and then in the recording right now, when I mess something up, I'll be like, Oh, Hey Chris, hang on, cut this out. And then three, two, one. So Robert Oppenheimer. And that way, when you're editing, you can see it's a lot easier to edit. Cause it's not like, sorry, I messed up. So Robert J. Oppenheimer, that's hard to edit. But if you take a minute to pause, stop, and then say, so Robert J. Oppenheimer, it's easier to, to stitch that together. And a lot of things like that, you just don't think about. And I'm sure you guys are all familiar with the person, the boom guy in movies. He holds a giant pole with a big, like, fuzzy sock on the end above the characters. That's a shotgun mic. And what that does, and there's cardioid mics, which is a heart shape, and then there's shotgun mics. The directions of the sound that it picks up, like I'm speaking into a Shure SM7B right now, like a Rogan mic, and I'm speaking directly into it. That's this kind of mic. But a boom mic, like a shotgun mic, has to be able to get the voices of two characters talking while it's way above their head. So the technology of that mic has to, to get all that detracting again, that boom guy's holding a pole and attached to that pole is a wire, an XLR cord which then clips to a sound recorder, usually a Zoom. Your Zoom is what it's called, the brand. And that is where the sound of the movie is. And like, there's the sound guy and the sound editing team. And this is why movies win Oscars for the sound. And I'm sure Oppenheimer will. That then, and you hear, you see the movie, like the classic, someone says action and hits the clapboard. That actually, one, tells the person in the video, okay, this is scene one, take seven or whatever. But that clap, when you hit it, is so that when you add the video track and the soundtrack to the, like go to edit it, you can find that little wavelength in the video where you hear the, the clap and you can add that with the clap in the video so you can synchronize it. Now the software can do it on its own. It can figure it out, but that's how it used to be done. And it's also just a solid frame of reference because it can't get it exactly to the point. So someone has to go in there and like molecularly move it to that. So your mouth might not be moving. It's really uncomfortable when you're watching something where their mouth isn't synced to how they're talking or how it sounds. It's annoying. So that's something like I get fixated on when I edit videos because I have the camera recording, but then I have a shotgun mic above me if I'm doing a skit floating head thing or when I'm podcasting, obviously right here, I'm talking into the mic. I hope this is interesting to you because I, I love this stuff and can talk about it all day, but sound... Uh, there's stuff called Foley, and you're probably familiar with this one lady. She's a Foley artist. I think she's from Spain or Italy. She is like the most known person in Hollywood for like doing stuff. So like in sex scenes in a movie, like they're not really holding the microphone to the, the bed, like getting the creaking of it because it's not going to be the best sound. So she'll actually in the studio take a chair or something and hit it really hard on the floor or against the wall or on, you know, to some object to make that sound and have a really professional mic with that, and they add that sound later, just like I was talking about in Planet Earth. The sex scene reference is pretty common because it's like it, she always posts that because it's funny, and it's just awkward. But stepping on ice, walking on... So Davy Jones with his peg leg, or Barbosa with his peg leg on Pirates of the Caribbean, someone has to add that sound because the camera is not picking up that like wood-on-wood wood sound that's coming from a sound after a post. It's edited in post. That's fun. And then so lighting is really important with video. In the lecture, lighting isn't too big a deal because the whole lecture room is lit and it's lit so that you can see the projector and the, the presenter. I wasn't too worried there. But in a cave video, like a skit that I do, I have to one, add what's called a key light on me. And that is right now above me right here, 45 degree angle towards my face. And that adds light 
fills my face with light. I can't really describe how important light is until you realize how important light is. It, it makes the difference between good video and not. And you'll see some YouTubers start out with their iPhone talking into the camera and they'll eventually add like a lav mic, which is the mic that clips to your lavalier, clips to your shirt. You probably see that in interviews all the time and they're like, oh, how do I button this up? And then they'll switch to, then it drastically looks different, their set. And you'll see in the background, the set has now more depth to it. They added a plant, they added like some LED strip lighting, or they added a, you know, even a ring light, which got pretty popular during COVID because of Zoom and everyone needed to be lit up a little better. And you've probably seen a ring light and girls doing makeup videos or dance videos and stuff. I see that a lot and things like that. Like I would watch like makeup tutorials <laughs> on uh, YouTube to figure out like how they used lighting and that. I forget what else I used makeup tutorials for. There was something that like, I was thinking, how would I learn that? I was like, oh, okay, that subject would probably have that. Or people that do videos on like tech stuff, how to zoom in on something. I have the key light on my face which creates a light on my face, right? But then the other half of my face past my nose is going to be dark. So either you have to have a big white sheet right there that reflects the light. And remember, light is waves. So it comes off of and bounces off of things. So you can put a white sheet or a white, you've probably seen a big white like foldy thing. I can't describe it. Or they hold like a big metal thing. I can't do it. Or you have a fill light, which is just a secondary light that, Puts the other side of your face. It adds depth to your face. And if you're not sure what I'm talking about, just Google good lighting versus bad lighting and you'll see exactly what I mean. It makes all the difference. And that's something that's really important in my videos because I have to have the light on me to distinguish me. And then I have to add a light to like the side light and the light, the key light, sorry, on my main face and the fill light on the side that is a less powerful light that just kind of fills in. So it's not the dark side of the moon on my other side of my face, right? But then I have to separate myself from the cave background. And again, this is all like overwhelming information. Over the years, I made it better. And the the backlight behind me then separates me from the background, kind of like I was saying with the green screen. And if you've noticed behind people, are, and there's also a hair light is what it's called too. If I'm sitting in the cave, right? The cave that I made, I have to put a light behind me so you can see the light spilling over my shirt, which much like, here you go, bring it full circle. Wanting to add the, the what was it? The stroke over the words on a meme, right? The black outline in the text makes all the difference when you're reading it. So you have to add an outline to your body to distinguish you from the background. And that's what a, a backlight does. So on top of that, I was like, okay, damn, got me lit. How do I add fire? fire flicker to this because that's the main part of the cave if I'm in a cave, right? I searched for weeks on how to do this and it is very, very rare in movies that they they do it in a, in a practical way with actual fire because it's hard to control the lighting. Some people use a light with a flicker switch on it. It's just an orange light that flickers that looks like fire. Probably it's not the best way to do it and you can probably now animate fire on like a flicker on top of somebody. I don't know, but it's the realistic way to do it. I could not find how to do it. I could not. And then I thought, where in movies, like in a prehistoric setting, would you see fire? So I watched Clan of the Cave Bear, and then I forget what the other one is, something about Quest for Fire. And then I was like, oh shit, Dances with Wolves. They're in teepees. I, so I got the DVD and I watched the background. This movie this is really old of me. Watch the the extra scenes or whatever the behind the scenes and i saw what they were using was that flicker light but they had like a different thing on it with smoke in front of it or something like that to make it more natural and i was like oh damn and then my neighbor added a flame flicker light to their lantern on their front porch those led flame light bulbs things and i was like oh shit so i then got that and i found essentially like a reverse chandelier it's like um it holds up six light bulbs right on a little stand and it's supposed to probably hang down but i have it sitting up and i got six of those led bulbs that all flicker at different speeds and stuff and i put that in between so the fill light the key light or like on the sides of me the little flicker lights are right in front of me beneath the camera frame that are flickering on my face so that way i'm lit up like i'm in a cave and it looks natural and 
that's all stuff that if I on square one was like, how do I film a cave scene? I would just jump because it's, it's just like no way not jump. I would just be like, I'm not doing this. Like I'm out. I'm going to go do accounting. There's no way to do it. And you just learn it over time. So keep that in mind and I'll, I'll come back into the next segment. Stay tuned. If you're still here, welcome back to segment three of Alive and Ruins podcast, episode 60, 169. I went on a tangent about lighting, and Stefan Milo, we've had him on the show before. Him and I text each other all the time, like, how did you do this, or how do I edit that? And we nerd out on it, because there's no other archaeologists that I know of that know this stuff, not to teach myself. And like when I can nerd out about like how... X, Y, or Z works. Or I was like, how'd you add that shake to the camera? Sometimes he'll just add like an effect called camera shake to the the camera, the video, so that it looks handheld. And that way it's just a little more visually intriguing. And I promise you, if you go watch a new show or another show or watch a movie or anything, think about the lighting, how much that has to do, how much shit is in the background that you're not seeing on the other side of the camera or above it or below it. Think about the lighting, think about the sound, Think about, is that set real or is that a green screen? Usually you can tell, like on the news when they're doing the weather report, that's a green screen, sometimes a blue screen. You can tell it's kind of shitty and fake. Or like on TikTok, it's it's really shitty, the AI software that does the the green screen. But it it makes TikTok, it, that's why TikTok's such an interesting platform because anybody can like make a fully edited movie. There's one dude who makes like really existential existentialism short films that are like a minute long or three minutes long where he's just asking questions and talking to himself, but he adds videos of the beach or he adds like different angles or like he'll record him upside down or like a weird thing of him, like holding an orange. I can't describe it. It's just when you see a good movie, like an Oscar winning movie, you're like, okay, that's why it, it wins Oscars. And in, in Oppenheimer, I'll say too, the whole beginning of the movie is fast paced as hell and like i wanted to pee the whole time but you're locked in and that was nolan's goal because you with these scientists are in this time crunch to build the nuclear bomb before the nazis do and especially before the soviets do later on because they found out the soviets were building one so you're in this rush with them and then when matt damon shows up as the military guy who's like hey we need to work on this together we need you to make a bomb for national security like you're you're in this fast paced thing with them and the music builds and I think there's like an electric cello and violins in the background. I think the Dark Knight and the Dark Knight Rises is all electric cello. I know for a fact in Interstellar they tried to do practical effects and it's the the best visual of a black hole apparently there is, like with the rendering they did and NASA uses it. Regardless, in, in that Hans Zimmer, the sound the the composer he didn't, Christopher Nolan didn't tell him what the movie was about. He just said it's like a father and a daughter or something like that. He didn't tell him it was in space. And in the movie, he put it all in a church organ for some reason. And the interstellar theme, I think it's called Cornfield Chase or uh, what's the, the main one? The docking scene and, and when they're trying to add the ship back after Matt Damon blows it up. That song, like you've probably heard it on a million TikToks or videos on Instagram or YouTube videos. It's a amazing score and all he did christopher nolan did was tell him to make a, a song about a score about a father and a daughter and then later like you know you'll watch the movie and you'll add music to it and jurassic park the jurassic park theme you probably associate that with when they're looking at the bronchiosaurus or the, the brachiosaurus eye walking when he's like welcome to jurassic park like that's in your memory and of course when star wars starts you hear the that is like the bombastic fanfare that John Williams does, which is also, he does um, Jurassic Park and E.T. and all that. And Spielberg uses him all the time. George Lucas did too. That dude made a, lo a lot of movie themes. Indiana Jones, like that's all John Williams. And you can tell it's John Williams and it's like a, can't describe it. it. It puts you in the mood and Star Wars is supposed to be like a space opera, which was originally what it was. And it puts you in the setting for that. But in terms of doing video for your jobs or archaeology or anything else, sound is important. I kind of did this on my own, but then I learned that Quentin Tarantino does it. And I would say Quentin Tarantino is my favorite director. 
he's so good, dude. And I, I think Inglorious Bastards is a masterpiece and probably one of the best movies ever made. I would say up there in the top five. Django is also great after that. But in, in that movie, Tarantino will listen to soundtracks in his office or in his house with like records. And he'll narrate and make and write a whole scene in his head based off of that music. So Inglorious Bastards, if, you, if you've seen the movie, I can't explain the plot. It's so intricate right now, but they're in Nazi Germany or Nazi occupied France. And there's Americans that are in there trying to, I can't, it, it's, it's a Tarantino movie. There's too much to talk about, but Nazis and Americans and also a French woman and Christoph Waltz. Point being, if you think about the movie, it's a Western. Most of Quentin Tarantino movies kind of are, or at least Django is, but it's a Western in the South. Inglorious Bastards is a Western, but set in World War II in Nazi-occupied France. And the beginning of the movie, you hear like the Fear Elise that starts playing, but then it turns into Spanish guitar because they're in France, which makes sense. Like you got that Celtic sounding guitar sound, but also the guy's looking, he's folding his sheets, putting them on the dryer, the clothesline outside. And he sees the Nazis driving up to his house to come interrogate him. And it's just like a Western where you would see a wagon or horses on the horizon coming in. And then the Spanish guitar plays. And so that movie is set up that you're like, okay, it's a Western. And you don't, even if you don't think about it, it's just the format. Americans are so used to the Western. And then again, Tarantino has an incredible way of writing dialogue to keep you in. And again, like not to say that's what I do in my lectures, but Tarantino is an engaging movie maker because of the scenes. And that first scene in the glorious bastards where Christoph Waltz and the other, I can't remember the actor's name. doesn't matter. Major Pedit is like his name in the movie. They switch between French, English, and I believe German at one point. And, or at least later in the movie, Christoph Waltz is clearly speaking German, but like the way it switches and like, there's the people hiding in the basement. It's tense. There's no music. It's just dialogue and the switching languages. And you know that the, he's hiding the Jews underneath the floorboards from the Nazis. And you know, Christoph Waltz knows they're there. And you know, this guy is going to get in trouble because he's hiding them. And he's in this morally, morally tough spot like what do i do protect my family or these people and the whole scene if you think about it too they show you each angle you see christoph waltz's face the guy's face you see the background you're in there in every angle and he makes sure you see how small the room is in the house so that you're trapped in this tense moment and like later on the music will kick in and he builds tension that way. And again, in the scene in the basement scene, if you've never seen this movie, sorry, I'm going on so long about it. The scene in the basement where Brad Pitt's like, we're fighting in a fucking basement. Uh, <laughs> he shows you every angle of that basement to show how tight it is in there and how small and how tense this room is when you realize the Nazi officer realizes that Michael Fassbender is a spy. And you know that and you know he knows that. So you're wondering where this is going to go. And again, there's the gun under the table, is a shootout. They even mention a Mexican standoff. And it, it's a Western. All that said, I don't know what I was getting. I just, I love Tarantino. He does that Kill Bill too. It's like, it's supposed to be a comic book, like as a movie, if that's the vibe. Cause it, his, his movies are just so good. But music is intense and, and, and timing and all that stuff is intense for filmmaking. But thinking about all that when you're watching movies, like apply that to stuff that you're making if you, if you want to make videos or if you're teaching or just like I had to give a speech at my cousin's wedding. I was his best man. Like I consider him my brother and I had to give a speech and I gave a whole speech about anthropologically what marriage is and yada, yada. And like, okay, yeah, here's, here's a, here's a good way of talking. So I remember getting like, massive applause for this and a bunch of people like coming up and shaking my hand afterwards at how good a speech it was. I literally wrote it 30 minutes to an hour before because I didn't realize I was supposed to, or an hour before the wedding, I should say, didn't realize I was supposed to give like a full speech. I, I didn't know that. So I just wrote it and I had my phone out with some bullet points, but I don't, can't remember it fully, but I was like, you know, as an anthropologist, we study cultures and in the world, you know, anthropologically, there are four fundamental things that are unique 
or that are fundamental and seen in every culture in the world that defines it as a human culture. And that is a celebration of death and birth. I talked about driver's licenses, right? And a rite of passage. And then funerals are a thing. And then the last one is marriage. Every culture has marriage. And then I talked about how Sam and Cassie, the people getting married, how like I met them and how long I've known them and that I've kept in touch with Sam and our six friends or five friends from Nashville since high school because of group chats. And like we all stayed together, talked to each other every day in a group chat and like have kept that communication and talked about how marriage in anthropologically is an evolutionary adaptation because it, you're uniting one group of the species with another group of the species to secure resources. Sam now has the resources of Cassie's dad, who is wealthy as hell, Southern California. And you're solidifying those bonds to ensure your evolutionary success. And even like, if you think about it back in the day, like in medieval times, they did it to secure land or land tenure or like, you know, the, the, the Habsburgs and all the trading of uh, kings and queens in Europe and why they're all inbred getting attracted. I was going on about gang initiation and driver's licenses and talked about Game of Thrones and then talked about cell phones and keeping together and stuff. But I talked about how Sam was a always a rock for me when I was like freaking out or I'd call him, stuff like that. Got to Sam and then I talked about Cassie a bit. Can't This was in 2019. I can't remember all of it. But at the end, I brought it back to Sam and Cassie being like a solid example of human culture because I've known them forever. Their sociality in my life and like being rocks for me has kept me evolutionarily fit and alive. And that the joining of their two unions was like, uh, I can't fucking remember, but like, it was just like that. It was like destined to happen because they were, they were good together. And like, I was like, all right, raise your glass to like the best humans I know blah, blah, blah. Can't remember the whole the le lecture or the whole speech. I guess you're getting the gist maybe. But at the end, I got like a wild round of applause and like her whole family that didn't know me at the end came up and talked to me and they were like, whoa, you're the anthropologist cousin. And I was like, yeah. And like the people that he worked with. And then this one guy was like, I give speeches all the time for work. And he's a big insurance company guy. And he was like, I was lost in the middle of your speech but you brought it back at the end, back to marriage. And I loved it. <laughs> and like the way he's like, you lost me. But then when I came back with the thing at the end, uh, I should probably just read the speech later for you to understand it. But he congratulated me on that. And again, I made that speech like 30 minutes before the wedding. And I don't remember where I was going with that. I'm not just trying to say I wrote, I wrote a good speech, I promise. But it was using the skills that I have from speaking, like public speaking and archaeology and giving PowerPoints, kind of just gave bullet points in a on a note on the notes app on iPhone and just read a speech and made it based on anthropological things that I knew. And then talked about, you know, Sam and Cassie, my friends and stuff, which is what you're supposed to do with the wedding speech. But it felt good. And like I'm technically like a performer in a way when I do my videos or like stand up stuff. So like it just, you always take those opportunities to practice and like use your skill. And I really liked that. I remember it being like a good feeling when everybody was like, holy shit. Cause it's like Sam and Cassie's wedding, but these people were coming up and being like, that was a fucking good speech, dude. And her poor sister gave like a speech where she was shaking and like, uh, Cassie has been my rock for 25 years. <laughs> Then like it lasted 30 like painful seconds. And then like I went up and just like chappelled it <laughs> and it was fun. It's good knowing that I have those tools. And like when I gave the dog lecture for a Wyoming talk, I remember Spencer Pelton's wife, Hallie Pelton came up to me at the end and just like shook her head and she was like, you have a talent. And I was like, thanks. And it's a good feeling to have that. So it sounds like I'm trying to gloat. I'm I'm not. There's a there's a point to me saying this. It's just the methods in which I speak and publicly teach and stuff, whatever it is, like my therapist, maybe they're right that I just speak so fast and give so many things that you can't keep up and you have to stay paying attention or you're going to get lost or it's the humor or it's just the genuine like I specifically remember in that lecture, I just made something up on the fly. Like I ad lib or like improv 
when I'm talking about something to explain it better. And like one that I improved was like, humans are insane. We are like bipedal primates that come barreling out of the woods, holding a simple machine with an atlatl that they have made out of wood and that they have taken a bit into a deer spine to get the uh, the sinew, wrap the sinew around the end with bird feathers they plucked, realizing that bird feathers fly. They added those to the end of the atlatl to make it fly better. And they did that. And they also can take a stick and spin it really hard and make a fire out of it, like make something combust. And at the same, like they come barreling out of the woods and they took a rock and smashed it down from this big down to a point. And then also at the same time are wearing the flayed skins of another animal. And everybody just started laughing. And then like, as they were laughing, that came into my mind that like, and that's probably why aliens haven't come to visit us. And that fucking killed. And it was just something that came to me in the moment. Cause like, I can't describe it. It's just like the audio, I kind of black out and like, I forget the audience is there, but the laughter it's like fuel. I can't describe it. I, I guess it's how a stand-up comedian would talk about it, but it just came on the fly and stuff like that is what makes me lecture good. And I can't really, if you, I mean, if you agree that I lecture good, if you don't, that's fine. Speak good. <laughs> what might be unique to me, like I have nervous tics. I'm like a neurotic person and I talk really fast. That's where that comes from. And that's probably why I'm able to do it that way. And I'm not saying like, you have to have that to be a good speaker, but there is some quality about you that you are hyper stoked about, whether it's dogs or archaeology or spreadsheets or minerals or rock tumbling, or maybe you're a big fan of how city planners add playgrounds to towns. Like, get hyped on that. And something that you're hyped on, make a PowerPoint about that if you want to practice. And everything you want, like dump on it. if you're into Yu-Gi-Oh or you're into fucking magic or you're into chess, like write a PowerPoint about that, about the history of chess, why you like chess and like what chess does for you and the logic of it. And like, you know, the, the Russian and American Queens Gambit, like rush, like with the Soviet, you know what I mean? Like talk about that and get stoked about it. And that's how you practice, man. And, or lady. And you make a PowerPoint about something you like and give it to yourself. Tell it. I do it. I rehearse it in the shower. I come up with a lot of lines in the shower or things that I should talk about and do that. Because when you have to give a talk on a paper that you wrote that you probably didn't really care about the paper, you just had to do it. You're going to have to get up there and give a talk about that paper. You got to seem somewhat intrigued about it and you got to somewhat, you know, make it interesting. So you're not just sleeping, listening to it or people aren't. So I do that and I add my like neuroticism and like the jokes to my stuff and then like the flashy animations and video on top and that stuff you can do. Like I take that from, I just naturally kind of was doing that, but other YouTube videos that I watch, like I notice a lot of YouTubers will do this or that. And I'm like, oh, I should probably add that too. And cause it seems to be what is, I guess, hashtag trending in like the current zeitgeist of what YouTube videos should look like, you know? And just keep up with those, I guess, trends or fads. And I try not to conform to all those, uh, but I do add some stuff. Things like that you can all add to what you do. And I think I started the this whole podcast in segment one talking about the dog lecture. All of that, like all my neuroticism, all of the knowledge I have about dogs that I've talked about over and over and over again on this show, on other podcasts, on my Instagram. And giving that talk so many times over Zoom during COVID, I just know it. Like, I don't have to look at the PowerPoint. I do for some things. I've given that so many times that I can just kind of, like I said, black out or zone out and just give it. And therefore, every time I, I do it, I can add ad lib more jokes. I know what joke killed. I know what joke didn't kill. And specifically, I, I learned this because of stand-up comedy. And I experienced this and then then learned it from stand-up comedy. The room, the room is important. If when it was a tight room at the Wyoming talk in a classroom, it the room was tight and intimate and it was everyone kind of knew each other and they were able to laugh a lot more. So I could go more wild and curse more. Cursing also, by the way, is like it immediately endears me to somebody because I'm like, okay, this guy gets it. Like if a professor just drops an F bomb, I'm like, cool, he's not like a pretentious asshole. So I, I always do that. 
use it wisely. There's times when you should, times when you shouldn't. In that intimate room, it killed. But in a big lecture hall where everyone's kind of spaced out stochastically in the audience and they can't, I can't hear them laugh as much or see them, it was harder for me to do the jokes. So I added a laugh track on top of them because you couldn't hear them. The mic was on my shirt, like the lav mic. So you couldn't really hear the laughs anyway. I only heard like the front row, like some giggles. But I remember people laughing at something. So I added a laugh track to it like you would in a movie or a sitcom. And I just looked up sitcom laugh tracks and put them on there. And that makes it engaging because then people watching the video on YouTube, like, no, okay, it's it's cool to laugh at that. Or like, you know, that I fucked up and said something and said something on the fly. So practice that stuff. Oh, sorry, the intimate room thing. Comedians will always tell you like a tiny club in like, you know, Pennsylvania or the comedy cellar in New York. It's an intimate room. You're familiar with it. You know, everyone there is there paying a lot of money to see you talk and give a show. But when you're just starting, like when I was doing stand up, like you're in a room that's mostly full of comedians and maybe their girlfriend if they bring them or their boyfriend. And they're all like, they hear you tell the same jokes every week. And if you get picked, it's all a random order sometimes. And the guy, the MC will put people he knows are good that are recurring people. It's interspersed throughout it. So he keeps the show good. But if I'm picked like early, like I'm fifth to go up, there's like 30, 40 people in the room and every joke will kill because or not, not every joke. I have more ability to make that joke work and see how many people are laughing and what they laugh at based on how I said it. And like the demographic that laughs at it, all that stuff goes through my head when I'm talking and you can see that. But when it's the end of the night and I went up second to last and it's just the MC and three people and I was telling a joke about gay porn, it was very awkward. So I just left and like the joke was about like, I ran out of, probably shouldn't say this on the podcast, like, but I mean, it's just a joke. I ran out of straight porn, so I started gay porn uh, and then, you know, gave it the college try. It wasn't for me. And like, it was, that's not really that funny saying it now in a room when it was a lot of people, the way I said it and the way it was funny was funny, but in, in the room of small people, no, when there's no one. So when I give a lecture, I know what works and what doesn't, and I can keep that slide and add what works and add what doesn't. I went on a whole tangent about lighting and I think I talked about Tarantino and then really stoked about Oppenheimer and sound in planet earth. But my, please, when you watch something now, a YouTube video or you watch, that's a good point too. watch someone, a YouTuber you like, and then go back and watch their earliest videos and see over time how they progressed into like what their visual and their sound effects and stuff are now. Cause you can see like what is different and what makes it better. And when you watch a movie like Planet Earth or you're watching something on Netflix, pay attention to the lighting and like the Dahmer series. It was all dark and yellow and it's to make you uncomfortable. Zombie movies and like war movies, Saving Private Ryan for sure. In the beginning of it, in the big invasion of Normandy scene, the camera rate, the frame rate is really slow so that it's really shaky and like hectic because that's what Spielberg was trying to get you to feel as well. And a lot of action sequences and stuff, things are, the frame rate slowed down so that you can, you know, it's tense and like you're scared, like in a fight scene, but then in a scene that's like supposed to be a, you know, someone recalling a memory, it's always in slow motion. It just helps you with the vibe. I, I'm still going on a rant. Watch things, pay attention to how it does or how things that you notice in it, like what's going on in the background, what you like about it and the things that I've said. And if you want to do this, like make video or make media, or you just want to be better at lecturing, I hope this helped. And just pay attention to people you appreciate in the in these spaces and make it unique to you would be my advice. And my advice to myself right now is I am 26 minutes into the segment, so I'm going to end it. Thank you guys. Uh, please rate and review the podcast if you can. If you want more solo episodes like this, let us know. I think that's kind of how we're going to start doing it here and there and yeah rate and review thank you for listening i don't know what else i'm supposed to say connor's shitty joke hey connor you have a shitty joke no okay cool all right um we're out thanks for listening to a life in ruins podcast you can follow us on instagram and facebook at a life in ruins podcast and you can also email us at a life in ruins podcast at gmail.com
This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV traveling the United States, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, Dig Tech LLC, Cultural Media, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Chris Webster. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com.